Lord, as we open up your word this morning, we pray that you'd open up our hearts and our minds to hear and to receive from you. Lord, we pray that you'd help us to understand this passage, what's going on, and that, Lord, you'd speak to us personally, individually, that we'd all hear your voice and receive a word uh, that is meant for us, that we'd go away fed, built up, and encouraged in our faith, and uh, better equipped to be able to serve you and to bring you glory. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, if you'd like to open up your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 12 this morning, 1 Samuel chapter 12, this is our manner for the day, and we are carrying on with the story of Samuel and Saul. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 5, the elders of Israel had gathered to Samuel in Ramah and said, Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Now this declaration was triggered by the corruption of Samuel's two sons, Joel and Abijah, whom Samuel had set up as judges. They were not doing, uh, acting righteously or governing the people right. And so the elders had objected. And uh, in doing this, the elders of Israel were, yes, rejecting Samuel's sons, which was understandable, but they were also rejecting Samuel and his judgeship. But more importantly than that, in requesting a king, what the elders of Israel were doing was they were rejecting God as their king. And this is made very clear in what the Lord said to Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 7. They have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, says the Lord, that I should not reign over them. Now since chapter 8, we've gone through chapter 9, 10 and 11, and we've seen a journey. Uh, where Saul was providentially directed to cross the path of Samuel, and Samuel anointed uh, Saul as the king. And this calling was first confirmed to Saul through three signs. Then this calling was then uh, made public at a, a, a national assembly at Mizpah, where there was a dividing of the tribes and then of the families until it became evident that Saul was to be the king over Israel. But the public was divided. There was widespread support for Saul and his kingship, but there were also rebels who had despised Saul. So things weren't confirmed. Things were on a shaky ground. But then a crisis hit Israel. The Ammonites attacked the Transjordan city of Jabesh Gilead, led by a man called Nahash. And word reached Saul in Gibeah and at the same time that the word reached Saul, the Holy Spirit fell upon Saul and he slew a yoke of oxen and sent the butchered meat throughout the whole of Israel, stating, whoever does not go out with Saul and Samuel to battle, so it shall be done to his oxen. This call to arms caused the fear of the Lord to fall on the people and an army of 330,000 Israelites gathered to Saul's banner and marched on Jabesh Gilead. And then at a dawn raid, Nahash, uh, Nahash and the Ammonites were completely and utterly routed. And this was a tremendous victory, a landmark victory for Saul and for Israel, because it confirmed Saul as the Lord's anointed deliverer of Israel in the eyes of the people. It silenced the rebels and prompted Samuel to, say, to seize upon the opportunity and beckon everyone to go to Gilgal, and there at Gilgal, they had a coronation ceremony and Saul was confirmed as king to the whole of the nation. As we pick up the passage here in chapter 12, everybody is still in Gilgal. And Samuel understands the historic significance of what's happening because his time as judge has officially come to an end. The baton of responsibility to judge and Israel has been passed to Saul. And so he uses this coronation ceremony not only to pass the mantle of civil authority to Saul, but to make his farewell address to the whole of Israel. And so what we have here in chapter 12 is Samuel's farewell address. Uh, so in the wake of a great military victory led by Saul, the temptation for Israel is to put their faith in the new king. Samuel wants Israel to know that the nation's future success and blessing does not rest with trusting a king, but in trusting the Lord. The king is only God's servant, and it is imperative 
that both the king and the nation obey God and his covenant. So Samuel uses his farewell address to defend his ministry first, to remind people of God's mercy to Israel, and then to finally exhort the people to fear and obey the Lord. So let's read verses 1 to 5. Now Samuel said to all Israel, Indeed, I have heeded your voice in all that you said to me and have made a king over you. And now here is the king walking before you. And I am old and grey-headed. And look, my sons are with you. I have walked before you from my childhood to this day. Here I am, witness against me before the Lord and before his anointed, whose ox I have taken, or whose donkey I have taken, or whom have I cheated? Whom have I oppressed, or from whose hand have I received any bribe with which to blind my eyes? I will restore it to you. And they said, You have not treated, cheated us or oppressed us, nor have you taken anything from a man's hand. Then he said to them, The Lord is witness against you, and his anointed is witness this day, that you have not found anything in my hand. And they answered, He is witness. So Samuel had followed the wishes of Israel. He had made them a king. He had removed his corrupt sons from office. And thus he had preserved the integrity of the civil authority of Israel and prevented it from being corrupted and abused. And he says there, I have walked before you from my childhood to this very day. And so Samuel's mind returns to when he was first called of God as a little boy serving under the high priest Eli in the tabernacle. Being awoken in the night by a voice he mistook for Eli, the high priest, only to subsequently appreciate it was in fact the voice of the Lord. That voice told Samuel that judgment was to fall on the house of Eli. And from that time forward, the Lord was with Samuel. The words of the Lord were in Samuel's mouth. And everyone knew that he was a prophet of God from Dan to Beersheba. And from that day as a child to this day as an old man, grey-headed, Samuel has faithfully served the Lord and his people, a lifetime of service. Having judged the people his whole life, he now places his whole life before the people and asks them to judge him. Isn't that quite something? He's judged the people his whole life, but then he lays his life before them and says, you come and judge me. He says, here I am, witness against me before the Lord and before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Or whose donkey have I taken? Or whom have I cheated? Whom have I oppressed? Or from whom have I received any bribe with which to blind my eyes? I will restore it to you. I think it's quite incredible that Samuel lays his entire life and ministry before the people to be scrutinized and criticized, to invite people to find fault and failure in his service. Samuel effectively states he has not pursued dishonest gain, taken bribes or perverted justice, the very crimes his sons were guilty of, but which he, he removed. And you know, it's quite something. We all know leaders, politicians, priests and princes are judged in the court of public opinion. But when was the last time you saw a national leader voluntarily stand up before the nation and ask to have their character judged and assessed? Can you imagine our Prime Minister doing this? You know, this week, Humza Yousaf was elected the new leader of the SNP and became the first minister of Scotland. This followed Nicola Sturgeon's resignation back in February. And uh, on Thursday, the 23rd of March, Nicola Sturgeon gave her farewell address. Very, very different to Samuel's. Um, she reflected on her term in office she stated some of her trials and some of her perceived successes. I'm not even sure that I agree that they were successes. And then she thanked many of her colleagues and then she promoted her feminist the uh, ideology. Samuel didn't promote feminist ideology. But one thing she did not say is, here I am, witness against me before the Lord and before his anointed. Wouldn't it be an amazing thing wouldn't it be an amazing thing if our national leaders made themselves accountable to God and the people? How did the children of Israel respond to Samuel's question? Well, in verse 4 we read, You have not cheated us or oppressed us, nor have you taken anything from any man's hand. The people found no fault with Samuel, his life or his ministry. 
And this is probably why you find no politicians subjecting themselves to public scrutiny in this way. They have no confidence that they will be validated because they don't walk with fear before the Lord. Proverbs 10 verse 9 says, He who walks with integrity walks securely, but he who perverts his ways will become known. You know, when it comes to leadership, the Lord is looking for one thing above all else, and that is character. That is what God is looking for in leaders. If you look at the qualification for elders in Titus, 1 Timothy, and 1 Peter, it's not looking for degrees and doctorates. It's not looking for heritage and status. It's not looking for charisma and riches. It's looking for character. That's what God looks for in leadership. You know, when the Lord looks at his saints, when he looks at you, what he wants to see in you is character. And when the Lord works in the lives of his saints, when he works in your lives, what he's trying to develop in you is character. And not just any character, but the character of Jesus Christ. It starts at new birth, being born again. In 2 Corinthians 5.17 it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have been made new. What are the, uh, the old things that are passed away? What are the new things that have come? Character. He slowly takes away your old character and develops a new character in you. It comes as a result of being filled with the Holy Spirit. We all know the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. What is the fruit of the Holy Spirit? It is the character of Jesus Christ. When God comes and fills you with his Holy Spirit, he starts to bring forth the character of Jesus Christ within you. And that character is produced, the Lord's working in our lives. It says in Romans 5, verses 3 to 4, And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character hope. It takes time for God to build character into a person. It doesn't just happen overnight. That person needs to yield themselves to the Lord. You need to yield yourself to the Lord. You need to allow the hand of the great physician to cut away the dead flesh from your life. Become a diligent student of scripture so that the good seed of God's word is cultivated into your life. And then become trained and disciplined by the trials the Lord sends their way. And if you submit to the Lord in the midst of those trials, develop that perseverance, that perseverance will bring forth character. Don't be led astray by charismatic speakers with self-esteem messages or the high-profile evangelists who promise health and wealth. Their superficial character will deliver a superficial message. Look for the tried and tested saint who has had their character built by God. They will communicate life and health to your spirit they will deliver a message that is reflected in their life, a life of integrity like Samuel's. And then in verse 5, the Lord is witness against you and his anointed it is, uh, is witness this day that you have found, not found anything in my hands. And he answered, he is witness. Samuel can resign from the ministry of a judge with a clear conscience. However, the examination of Samuel's character is not so that he can feel validated. It is to give him a legitimate platform with which to speak the words of God, as the Lord now examines the character of Israel. You know, the Lord seeks to build godly character of, or the godly character of Christ in your life, not so that you can feel good about yourself or have others look up to you admiringly, but so that you can be entrusted with a calling and a ministry. That's why he's trying to instill that character in you. So you can bear fruit and serve the Lord effectively. The Lord wants to use you for his glory. But before he can use you, he has to prepare you. He has to develop that character in you. Let's go on to the next section, verses 6 to 11. Then Samuel said to the people, It is the Lord who raised up Moses and Aaron and who brought your fathers up from the land of Egypt. 
Now therefore stand still that I may reason with you before the Lord concerning all the righteous acts of the Lord which he did to you and your fathers. When Jacob had gone into Egypt and your fathers cried out to the Lord, then the Lord sent Moses and Aaron who brought your fathers out of Egypt and made them dwell in this place. And when they forgot the Lord their God, he sold them into the hand of Caesarea, the commander of the army of Hazor, into the hand of the Philistines and into the hand of the king of Moab, and they fought against them. Then they cried out to the Lord and said, We have sinned because we have forsaken the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtaroths. But now deliver us from the hand of our enemies and we will serve you. And the Lord sent Jeroboam, Bedan, Jephthah and Samuel and delivered you out of the hand of your enemies on every side and you dwelt in safety. So now the character of Samuel has been validated before the nation. He reviews the history of Israel from Moses to the present day. And throughout which, throughout which Samuel emphasises what the Lord did for Israel in his faithfulness. And when Samuel says, now therefore stand still, that I may reason with you, there's something of a court case setting uh, about this statement. He says, stand still, in the sense of silence, the court is in session, that I may reason with you, in the sense of a judge bringing a judicial litigation against Israel. And when Samuel says, concerning all the righteous acts of the Lord, which he did to you and your fathers, he's talking about uh, how in all that the Lord does in his faithfulness towards Israel, never once did he compromise his righteousness or his standards. As we will see, the only compromise will come from Israel in unrighteousness. So he starts off. Uh, and uh, in verse 8 he says when Jacob had gone into Egypt and your fathers cried out to the Lord then the Lord sent Moses and Aaron who brought your fathers out of Egypt and made them dwell in this safety in this place sorry so the faithfulness of God is first seen in the fact that God provided both food and a haven for Jacob and his family when they went down to Egypt God was faithful in looking after his people then then the faithfulness of God is seen in the second place when out of oppression and slavery that Israel experienced in Egypt, God raised up Moses and Aaron to deliver Israel. And then the faithfulness of God is seen a third time when the Lord brought the Israelites into the promised land under the leadership of Joshua. Throughout all this, God proved to be faithful to his people and to his covenant. But we read in verse 9, And when they forgot the Lord their God, they, he sold them into the hand of Caesarea, the commander of the army of Hazor, into the hand of the Philistines, and the hand of Moab, who fought against them. So in contrast to God's faithfulness towards Israel and faithfulness to the covenant, Israel forgot the Lord. They sinned, they worshipped other gods, they broke the terms of the covenant. And in this, God did not reject his people. In faithfulness to the terms of the Mosaic Covenant, he sold them into the oppression of various foreign powers. Now, why did God sell his people into the oppression of foreign powers? Well, any good parent will discipline their children. They won't simply threaten discipline and then not follow through. When they threaten to send them to the room and they continue to be disobedient, you'll send them to the room. If you say, if you don't change your behaviour, you won't have a meal tonight, and they don't change their behaviour, you'll deny them that meal. And if you warn them if they don't back up their ideas, they're going to get a spanking, and they don't back up their ideas, you follow through and you give them a spanking. It teaches them right from wrong, instills a respect for their parents, and initiates a change of character in the child. God was good to his word and faithful to his children. And when they carried on breaking the terms of the covenant and were acting disobedient, God brought discipline upon his people. And it was God's goodness that caused him to discipline Israel by handing them over to these oppressive forces. We read about Caesarea. He's in Judges chapter 4 uh, in the time of Barak and Deborah. And you might remember when uh, Barak and, uh, went out to fight against them, uh, Caesarea fled and he found refuge in the camp in the tent of Jael and Jael was a strong woman and she took a tent peg and banged it down into the temple of Caesarea. 
The Philistines, you read about them in Judges 3, 10 and 13. In fact, they're the perennial enemy of Israel. And under the uh, Judges, Shamgar, Jephthah, Samson, Samuel, God brought deliverance. And then finally, we read about the Moabites in Judges 3. This was uh, during, during the, uh, the judgeship of Ehud, who was left-handed. And the leader of the Moabites was a guy called Eglon, big fat sumo type guy. And uh, Ehud went in and with his left hand, he pulled out a concealed sword from his right side, thrust it into Eglon's belly. And he was so fat that it swallowed up the entire sword and the hilt. I always liked that story. Um, thing is, God raised up people to deliver, deliver his people when they cried out to him. Um, God never let them go. He continued to be faithful, even though Israel were unfaithful. Then they cried out to the Lord, it says in verse 10, we have sinned because we have forsaken the Lord and served the Baal and the Ashtoreths. But now deliver us from the hand of our enemies, then we will serve you. And the Lord sent Jeroboam, Bedan, Jephthah, and Samuel, and delivered uh, you out of the hand of your enemies on every side, and you dwelt in safety. The Lord's discipline brought about the result for which it was designed. Israel recognised their sin, they came to the Lord in repentance, and looked to him for deliverance. And we have seen before, sorry, they, they, they say we have sinned because we have forsaken the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtoreths. The Baals were the male Canaanite deities, the Ashtoreths were the female uh, Canaanite deities, and they would have had little um, idols depicted by these within their house, household idols of Baal and Ashtoreth, which they worshipped. But there is no deliverance, there is no salvation without recognition of sin and repentance of sin. God continued to allow them to be oppressed until they came to that place of recognition of sin and repentance of sin. And it's the same for us. Unless we recognise our sin and repent of our sin, there is no salvation. The work of the cross is sufficient to save all men of sin. But not all men will be saved because not all men recognise their sin and repent of their sin. True repentance is the fruit of faith in Jesus Christ. And God's grace towards Israel and his faithfulness to his, the covenant is again seen that he responds to, the, to that faith and repentance in Israel by raising up the judges to deliver them and causing the people to dwell in safety. And no matter how great your sin is, no matter how far you have fallen from the Lord, if you turn to him sincerely in faith and repentance, he will shower you with grace and mercy. He will forgive and remove your sin. He will wash you clean, clean, and he will take you to a place of salvation, security, and peace. He is a good God. Israel knew that, that goodness through his servants, the judges, and makes mention of Jeroboam there. That was another name for Gideon, Jephthah, Samuel, and a guy called Bidan. And we don't quite know who Bidan is. Some people think he is Barak. Some people think he is Samson. I see no reason why he couldn't be another deliverer that God raised up that we only read about here. The thing is, God always has a man to be able to carry out his work. Let's carry on to the next section, verses 12 to 19. And when you saw that Nahash, king of the Ammonites, came against you, and you said to me, No, but a king shall reign over us, when the Lord your God was your king. Now therefore, here is the king whom you have chosen and whom you have desired. And take note, the Lord has set a king over you. If you fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and do not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then both you and the king who reigns over you will continue following the Lord your God. However, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you as it was against your fathers. Now therefore, stand and see this great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes, is today not the wheat harvest? I will call to the Lord, and he will send thunder and rain, that you may perceive and see that your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight of the Lord, in asking a king for yourselves. So Samuel called to the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day, and the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. 
And all the people said to Samuel, Pray for your servants to the Lord your God, that we may not die, for we have added to all our sins the evil of asking a king for ourselves. So we've seen the character of Samuel, that it's one of integrity, and we've seen the character of God, that it is one of faithfulness. Now we shall see the character of Israel, that it is one of wickedness. He starts off, when you see that Nahash, king of the Ammonites, came against you, you said to me, no, but a king shall reign over us, when the Lord your God was your king. Now the wickedness of Israel was seen in their request for a king. The Lord had proven himself a gracious and faithful ruler who always delivered the children of Israel when they cried out to him. They had no need of a king. Yet when the threat of Nahash and the Ammonite, Ammonites came, their hope for deliverance wasn't aimed at God. It was aimed at a human king. You know, it's interesting, if we read that verse a little bit closer, it makes us want to revise our knowledge of the recent history of Israel a little bit. Which chapter of 1 Samuel did Israel request a king? It was chapter 8. And which chapter of 1 Samuel did Nahash appear? It was chapter 11. Thus the request for a king preceded the attack of Nahash according, uh, according to um, what we have read chronologically in 1 Samuel. If we reread 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 12, it suggests that actually the request for a king was in response to the attack of Nahash. Let me read it to you again. And when you saw that Nahash, king of the Ammonites, came against you, you said to me, no, but a king shall reign over us when the Lord your God was your king. And what many commentators believe happened is that Nahash and the Ammonites were doing a series of incursions into those Transjordan tribes over a period of years, slowly subduing and various different cities. And when this attack came, people cried out for a king. But it wasn't until Nahash attacked Jabesh Gilead that Saul actually rose to come and to defeat Nahash and the Ammonites. The thing is, whatever the true history of the matter, Israel didn't turn to Samuel, an established judge for deliverance. They didn't turn to God for deliverance. They requested a king. So in verses 13 to 15, now therefore here is the king whom you have chosen, whom you have desired, and take note. The Lord has set a king over you. Samuel has requested, answered their request, but then he goes on and he says, if you fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and do not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then both you and the king who reigns over you will continue following the Lord your God. However, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you as it was against your fathers. The Lord listened to his people Israel. He granted them their request for a king. But now that Israel have their king, the question is, will Israel listen to God? The basis of Israel's relationship with God at this moment in time was the Mosaic Covenant. Does the demand for a king invalidate the covenant and bring a permanent curse upon Israel? No. The terms of the Mosaic Covenant still stood for Israel. And within its promises, there was the promise of blessing if Israel were obedient, and the promise of cursing if Israel were disobedient. If they were obedient, God would be with the nation. If Israel were disobedient, the hand of the Lord would be against the nation. And despite Israel's sin and wickedness, he does not cast them off. He does not wipe them out. He honours the covenant he made with them, and he gives them a second chance at fellowship. And that should encourage us. When we get it wrong, he doesn't wipe us out. He doesn't cast us off. He gives us a second chance. You see, the Lord's heart is not to judge and condemn, but to restore and to relate. He's not looking to lord it over his people. He's looking to love his people. And what Samuel is doing at this turning point in Israel's history is saying, the judges may be ceasing, the kings may be starting, 
but the Lordship of God does not change. If you fear the Lord, if you serve the Lord, if you obey the Lord, you and the King, God will bless you. But if you reject the Lord, if you rebel against his commandments, if you disobey the Lord, you and the King, God will curse you. It's a kind of mini renewal of the covenant, but the Lord is saying nothing has changed. I am still the same and I still desire this service and this relationship from you. So how do the people know that what Samuel is saying is true? Well, the Lord is going to validate his words with a sign. And, uh, he's, what, the Lord, and what Samuel says is, I'm going to call to the Lord. I'm going to call to the Lord and request thunder and rain. Even though it's the wheat harvest, I'm going to call for thunder and rain. Then you're going to know that what I say is true and uh, you have done all this wickedness before the Lord by requesting a king. Now Israel enjoyed two periods of rain in their annual calendar, the Yura and the Malkosh. The Yura is the early rains, the Malkosh is the latter rains. The early rains happened in autumn, uh, which was very welcome after a long, hot and dry summer. And it was a light rain and it broke up the ground and prepared the field for uh, fields to be worked. And then the latter rain in spring was necessary for ripening the barley and the grain ready for harvest. And it was a much heavier rain. But we're in the time of the wheat harvest here. Slap bang in the middle of summer, not a single drop of rain ever falls. And so this was truly a miracle. Samuel calls out to the Lord and thunder sounds and rain falls. And not only does rain fall, but the fear of the Lord falls upon all the people. And the fear of Samuel falls upon the people as well. And they perceive their wickedness in demanding a king. And you know, fear is a healthy thing when it is directed towards God. There should be a reverential fear towards the Lord in all of our hearts. We need a revelation of the holiness and the righteousness of God that will stir up that godly fear in our hearts, that will inspire us to walk a sober and a righteous life before God. Beyond Israel's fear, how do they respond to the recognition of their wickedness? Well, in verse 19 it says, And all the people said to Samuel, Pray for your servants to the Lord your God, that we may not die, for we have added to all our sins the evil of asking for a king for ourselves. And at last we see the true recognition of the sin of the nation fall upon the people. You know, the former warnings of Samuel went unheeded. The terms of the covenant had no effect, but a miracle in the heavens was necessary to bring an awakening to the sin in the people's hearts. And this shows us something of the hardness of the heart of Israel, really that it takes the sign of thunder and rain to persuade the people. A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, Jesus said. And what do they say? Pray for your servants to the Lord your God. Even then, there is a reluctance within the people of Israel to engage with the Lord personally. They ask Samuel to pray for them. And even then, it's not pray to the Lord our God, it's pray to the Lord your God, they say to Samuel. There's a lack of personal identification between Israel and God. They don't want to relate with God. There is still something hardened within their heart that has yet to be dealt with. Even then, a reluctance to engage with God. God does not want to be distant from his people. He wants to be intimate. He doesn't want to be known as the Lord your God. He wants to be known as the Lord our God. You know, when Jesus taught his disciples to pray, he taught them, our Father who is in heaven. The Lord wants to be on first name terms with you. He wants to hear your voice, to commune with you. Always be wary of those who want you to pray, but are unwilling to pray themselves. Okay, the last section, verses 20 to 25. Then Samuel said to the people, Do not fear, you have done all this wickedness, yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. 
And do not turn aside, for then you would go after empty things which cannot profit or deliver, for they are nothing. For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you his people. Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you, but I will teach you the good and the right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart, for consider what great things he has done for you. But if you still do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. So now that Israel has awoken to their wickedness, what happens next? Do they remove the king? Do they reinstate Samuel as judge? Have they missed the opportunity to serve God? Well, no. The first thing Samuel says, uh, does is bid the people, do not fear. He says, do not fear. You have done all this wickedness, yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord. Despite Israel's wickedness, they had not fallen so far as to be outside the purposes of God. The terms of the covenant still stood. There was still real hope for a fruitful future for the children of Israel. And the Lord makes two requests of Israel and he makes two promises to Israel. Two requests of Israel and two promises to Israel. Now the two requests are follow the Lord and serve the Lord. So let's look at those quickly. Follow the Lord. Do not turn aside from following the Lord, um, Samuel says. So as the Lord has always required of his people, so he continues to require of his people that they stay loyal and they follow, follow him. They're faithful to him. And you know there's always been two paths of which a man can walk. It's either been the narrow road or the broad road. The highway of holiness or the byway of sin the way of Abel, or the way of Cain. One path finds the Lord as your guide, the other path finds your heart as the guide. Jeremiah 17 verse 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? We shouldn't follow our heart. That will lead us down the byway of sin. We need to follow the Lord. And that's what the Lord is saying to Israel here. Follow me. Follow me. Don't follow your heart. Follow me. Israel had followed its heart and it led them into the wickedness of seeking a king. The Lord says, this is the situation you find yourself in by following your heart. From this point forward, follow me and I will lead you out. You know, Jeremiah 6, 16 says, Thus says the Lord, stand in the ways and see and ask for the old paths where the good way is and walk in it then you will find rest for your souls. We should be walking upon the old paths, the paths that the Lord lays down for our lives. The second request that God makes of Israel through Samuel is serve the Lord with all your heart. Now the heart may be deceitfully wicked, but when it is surrendered to God, given wholly to God, it is redeemed, it is cleaned, and it is changed. Hope for Israel lies in following the Lord and serving him wholeheartedly. Anything other than that gives rise to folly and a pursuit of empty and profitable things. What does it say there, verse 21? And do not turn aside, for then you would go after empty things which cannot profit or deliver, for they are nothing. You know, my personal experience is that you wake up in the morning, refreshed, ready to start the new day, you spend some time with the Lord, you read his scripture, you feel built up and strengthened in the faith, and you're in a good place with the Lord. But as the day goes on, you get caught up with the things of life, you're busy working, you find that the influence of the world starts to creep in, the appetites of the flesh start to rise to the surface and you get back home at the end of the day and you're tired and you're feeling exhausted and that freshness with the God in the morning has just evaporated. At that point you've got the choice of those two paths to go down. Now if I come and spend time with the Lord I'll be refreshed, my eyes will be refocused upon him, and my evening will invariably be profitably spent. But the real temptation is I'm tired, it's been a long day, and what do I do? I start flicking through my phone, and I start watching nonsense on YouTube, or I sit on the computer and I start flicking around to this website and that website, and before I know, two or three hours have passed, I've achieved absolutely nothing, and all I've done is imbibed a load of junk. 
and do not turn aside from them. You would go after empty things which cannot profit or deliver, for they are nothing. If you don't make an active choice to serve the Lord, you will find yourself following empty things that do not profit. The Christian walk is not a passive pursuit, it's an active pursuit. You need to be disciplined and you need to make divine appointments to meet with the Lord. Fix them in your mind, in your head, in your heart, otherwise you'll be going down that wrong path to empty things that do not profit. I said there were two promises that God made to Israel as well. They were this, the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake. And the second promise, it has pleased the Lord to make you his people. Both of these promises speak of God's faithfulness to Israel. Though Israel might, uh, might fear God would reject and abandon them, after they had rejected God by demanding a king, we see the Lord is not like man. He is loyal to his covenant and his people. And the simple declaration that Israel are his people speaks of ownership and belonging. The Lord is holding on to them and he is not letting them go. These two promises have the sense of a marital commitment about them. The Lord takes Israel to be his wife. He promises to be faithful. He promises not to leave. He promises to have and to hold. This is the love of God to Israel, speaking reassurance to his people. And what of Samuel? Well, Samuel may be stepping down from being a judge, but he will continue as a prophet and a priest. He'll continue to pray for the people. He'll continue to teach the people. We forget that Samuel was a teacher, don't we? He would have expanded the scriptures. He would have taught the Torah to the people. He would have told them about the covenant. Even in old age, the Lord had a ministry for Samuel. It was prayer, prophecy, and preaching. And there is hope in these final verses for all of us. Even when you have sinned and fallen into the depths of depravity, when you feel your wickedness is on show for all to see like it was with Israel, there is still hope. Return to the Lord and serve him like before from the place you now find yourself. He is still your God. You are still his child and he has purpose and ministry for you. And when you are old, your health failing, your hair gray, you lack the strength and energy to what you did in your youth, there is still hope like there was for Samuel. You can pray. You can teach and pass on your wisdom to the younger ones. And you can prophesy. You can be a mouthpiece for God. There is always purpose for the children of God. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and we pray that those things that you have intended for us this morning would stay within our heads and our hearts and work their good. Help us to be faithful in our service to you and learn from the lesson this morning not to pursue and follow the things of our own heart, but to let you be our guide and to follow you in the path that you've laid out for us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.